All right, we might as well get started. Um, thanks for, uh, for coming today. Uh, I'm Derek Newby. I'm Associate Principal and Architect from Perkins & Will. And this is Yahya Matpur. I'm the Associate at Perkins & Will. And, uh, I direct uh, both the research and innovation efforts at the firm. Yeah, so we're going to show you some real-world examples of, of architecture using mass timber techniques and talk to you a little bit about um, sort of the computational and, and software aspects to that. It's mostly about projects and showing possibilities. Um, we have an abundance of graphics for you this morning, so you, you won't be able to fall asleep. Um, and we'll save some time at the end for a discussion or comments that you have. So um, we cover a lot of ground, so yeah, if you want to keep track of, of where we're at and ask questions at the end, that would probably be helpful. Uh, the agenda for the day, um, I want to talk just a little bit about why wood matters and why there's a renaissance um, of wood architecture underway uh, related to our awareness around climate change. And then show you a few applied examples, projects from 2013 to present, uh, where we've been advancing the use of timber in architecture. And then Yahya will close by uh, showing some sort of new innovations and in what's next. So really speaking, to start, um, understanding why we're advocating for wood and then why we think that you know, wood is the material of choice when we come to face climate change and things that are coming in a global concern. It is as simple as it is the only structural material that is grown by sun. Um, it is a structural material that has fantastic properties. Um, and if grown sustainably through sustainable resources, it can be a great benefit to the overall population um, and how we do buildings. The idea there is that you know, sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water, and nutrients from the soil come together, um, and through trees they release oxygen. That's the photosynthesis process. And from there, you get a huge benefit of wood products that they actually sequester carbon. They, they reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we otherwise in the air. And that is a huge change because the, the, the challenge of, cli of the climate change is really about carbon. Um, so understanding how we can actually sequester that carbon, have a, a sink for it, and build with a material that actually builds on this um, is, is for us the way to go. Um, so one of the things that you know, Derek would be speaking about is, is also beyond carbon is, is the energy story. Um, right. So th the takeaway really behind the wood story is that if you can't grow it, you have to mine it. The consequences of mining anything, we think, are far more uh, consequential and dramatic um, than the consequences of a properly managed sustainable forest. So. It's just a simple fact. Um, things you have to mine out of the ground, turn into cement or steel, uh, are more energy intensive. Um, and at a very high level, uh, we know that, that the inputs that even go into processing wood to become a product that goes into buildings um, you know, are dramatically less than any alternative that we can use. So it's a, it's a simple thing. We also happen to live in a rainforest in the west coast of British Columbia. Um, our regional economy is significantly dependent on forest products. Um, so being practitioners in this market, we're crazy not to use wood. Um, you know, it's plentiful. We have a great industry. We have amazing engineering resources. We have a supply chain now. Increasingly, we have um, people can build with this and erect buildings of this kind. So it seems like a natural thing for us to do. And when we talk about the future of building, we really need to stop thinking of the idea of consumption alone and start thinking about buildings that actually contribute or, at the very least, stop consuming. So when we have a renewable resource, we have energy that's sourced from renewable uh, techniques like hydro, uh, like wind, like solar, uh, you know, we start to close the circle into having a truly sustainable building cycle. We're miles away from that right now, but we know where we need to go. The story is around global resources uh, and how the building industry or sector itself is, is affecting um, that. So, some statistics around you know buildings are actually consuming forty percent of the global energy resources. Um, they're 
responsible for this. They're responsible of 25% of global water. That gives us the understanding of how significant the building and construction industry is in facing this global um, endeavor um, to face climate change. And understanding the scale of impact that we can have as we start to reduce our carbon footprint, as we start to reduce our resources consumption by making small tweaks on how we actually think about building. Um, so it's really about a shift of mindset of understanding it's not just about doing less harm, but it's actually doing more good. Um, how do you shift that perspective and change your materials of choices so that you're actually contributing in a positive way to the built environment? Um, so in that regard, we regard wood as an active urban repair. If you start using wood more, then you start you know, to create a, an environment where you're essentially benefiting from you know, all of these areas that we've been talking about to create a, an industry that is built on a more sustainable material, a material that actually looks towards the future. It's, it's natural, and it's creating this understanding of much lower consumption and more positive wood. Um, so we think that you know, wood is the material of choice. Um, it drives our aspirations toward uh, zero emissions. Now understanding that it is a holistic approach where wood actually talks to quite a few um, factors that affect the, the sort of the bottom line. Um, it's a cost-effective material. Uh, also buildings that are built with wood have a higher quality um, of environmental air quality, of uh, perception of warmth, and there's a beauty that comes with it that actually speaks to people. Uh, but also from an environmental perspective, um, it helps to cluster car to carbon, it helps reduce our emissions. So our studio here in Vancouver was founded in 1984 and we've been doing timber building since then. Um, the fantastic thing about timber in this market is that our earliest buildings were all made out of wood. Um, there wasn't really a steel industry on the west coast, there was very little concrete, it was expensive to ship in cement. Uh, so we had a lot of big Douglas fir trees and we turned them into buildings. And there's still some amazing buildings standing in Gastown, Yale Town that are made out of heavy timber, uh, typically clad with masonry and bricks that came from someplace else. Um, but timber's been a part of what we've been doing. Some of the buildings that you may know of ours that, that do feature timber prominently are things like Brentwood Skytrain Station uh, with these curved blue lamb arches. Uh, the Van Dusen Visitor Center is also a mass timber uh, project that we could have shown you. Uh, you know. Uh, a number of other buildings throughout the region all feature wood. We think it's important. It's a way of driving carbon down in our buildings, and it's a way of connecting with what the architecture of this place should be. We're not going to talk much more about timber. You probably get that we're believers. We understand. We know what we have to do. Science is well understood. The technology is apparent. Um, you don't need to convince us. We hope we don't have to convince you. Um, we see a very positive future for timber buildings moving forward. So on to a few case studies of um, applied use of, of timber and, and some of the sort of computational realities that we have doing it. So the first question is how do you build uh, in the middle of nowhere? Uh, this is in 2013. We were asked to build basically a hotel. Um, it's not really the middle of nowhere, but it's certainly remote. This is uh, very near the Yukon in the, the north of our province. It's a place that looks like this. It's boreal forest. It's uh, significantly driven uh, by the energy sector. Um, and it's a subarctic climate zone, so very demanding. So there's no Home Depot down the road. There's not a workforce sitting on standby. How do you build 400 rooms uh, to accommodate a workforce um, when you're in the middle of nowhere? So to us, that meant a timber solution. It meant we needed to think of modular buildings that were prefabricated. They have to be made out of timber because timber is lightweight, structurally effective, uh, and we have the resources to build these buildings effectively. And they likely should uh, approach the passive house standard. Now, in 2013, we were really at the beginning of sort of uh, the passive house um, movement in, in Canada. So uh, we used some passive house principles, but we, we came short of actually certifying or having a performance that would meet that level. The big reason is, is that there's very little sunlight uh, in the winter, and the winter is very harsh. Um, and we also had to make electricity. So uh, by making electricity, we had more heat than we knew what to do with. So we didn't really have to 
um, go to the full passive house level, but we still had R100 walls. Um, this is what a prefabricated mass timber modular workforce accommodation building looks like uh, if we get to build it one day. Right now it remains a project that's um, finished its working drawings and it's awaiting uh, a green light to go ahead. We should say that the first sort of applied topic that we used in this project um, around sort of software tools and computation was to help find the form for the building. Um, by using kind of a, uh, this is very low res, but using a grasshopper script and, and sort of a solver um, equation, we quickly tested a number of different building configurations about how to pile 400 rooms onto a site um, with these conditions and tested thousands, tens of thousands of options to try to find an optimal configuration. Some of the factors that we tested for were simple things, surface area to volume, trying to have a great form factor so that we're conditioning the least amount of space possible with the most efficient enclosure. Um, the configuration of the module, so how tall, wide, you know, we could make them any size we wanted. The only requirement really was that these were, you know, rooms for people. So the person's kind of the starting point and then you had to make a room and a bathroom around it. Uh, the height constraints, you know, the practical constraints from a building code perspective and a fabrication perspective about how tall a building like this could be in the middle of nowhere, whether it's two, three, four story or higher. The orientation of the building was another factor that we considered, trying to get the most of uh, south sunlight when we had it. And then last, making sure that any solution that we had could fit on a truck piece by piece and be trucked up and be capable of being craned into place. So that made for a very interesting set of equations to, uh, to devise different techniques to come up with the form. We should say that we do some plain, simple, analog, um, old school techniques as well. You know, we built cardboard mock-ups to test configurations in our studio just to make sure that we're gonna get this right. If you're gonna build 400 of anything, you really wanna make sure that you have it right. Of course, the, the precedent for what we came up with um, is right in front of us, you know, uh, Hudson's Bay Fort. You know, this is a mass timber building in a remote setting. And what we came up with was very much like a fort typology uh, where there was a bounded courtyard in the center with a double loaded corridor of um, basically accommodation rooms looping around the perimeter. You see the main floor is actually a combination of flat pack prefabricated timber elements, uh, timber structure and timber enclosure. Those are more demanding spaces. They have longer spans. Um, sort of all the public functions of the building happen there. Above that, we go into volumetric um, prefabrication where each room is made as a six-sided box and they come basically with the mattress in and the sheets on the bed and they get hoisted into place. This is what the building's principally made of. Um, you know, several hundred of these bedrooms which are um, private bathrooms and sleeping accommodation and uh, a desk to work in. The idea would be that a very small crew would be working up north, so trucks would arrive just in time. They'd be hoisted off of the trailer and onto the building with no staging. That's an important factor. The less handling, the better in every respect. As a result of making these things in a production line um, style, the coordination was really demanding. Every part of the coordination, so that demanded sophisticated models from all of our consultants so that we knew electrical, mechanical, structural, architectural elements all fit. So we went to a level of detail sort of plus 300, maybe 400 for some elements to, to get um, all of this to work in more of a manufacturing sort of attitude as opposed to just sort of a site built, solve your problem uh, approach, um, which required some commitment from the consultant team, but uh, we, we did have success doing so. This little animation of just you know, the scenario of how a uh, portion of the building we put together. We have rack-mounted, prefabricated um, services in the corridors that are units that get coupled together for electrical services and, and some plumbing. Most of the plumbing runs vertically, and I'll show you some pictures of that later. So that digital workflow um, was different than a conventional workflow because we were always thinking of a manufacturing process. So whether it's structural consultants with their drawings like this, um, difficult when you have an equilateral triangle to make grids make sense, but you know we found a way. Um, we did little things like indexing the rooms um, with a five degree twist, and that was largely to, to really enable um, tie-ins 
of the building enclosure and the envelope in an effective way without having to have perfect alignments because things move and shift and wood's a natural living thing. It also allowed us to have some chases created um, in the corridors that was just practical about servicing. Cross section of the building shows the prefabricated but flat pack uh, timber base and then the volumetric modules that go on top. Lots of assembly drawings like this created um, to communicate intent to builders. Traditional detailing workflow between structural and architectural. I'd love for this to be more integrated, but it still kind of had a parallel path. So we actually built some of these as prototypes to test the, uh, the technology. So we have, I guess three of them got built, uh, one remains. Um, so what we have is shop drawings created by the timber supplier. In this case, this is AHC Derricks out of Austria. So they use robots, of course, to, um, to cut all the CLT panels, to drill every hole, to think about things like hoisting and dunnage, to think about um, all the integration of services, to think about how things have to be assembled, pre-drilling holes for fasteners. Um, so very detailed shop drawings produced in this way. We also optimized the, the panel stock that we got, the CLT panel stock, to use waste. So we had offcuts, and we turned them into desks for the room and a bench that goes along the wall. So the panel that came from the supplier and then became CAD cut um, using a CNC mill and uh, you know had almost zero waste apart from some sawdust. This is the shop in, in Austria uh, where this happened. Uh, you can see the sort of robot uh, process for, for cutting spaces, piling um, materials and staging them so they fit into shipping containers and also organizing that load so that they come off in the reverse order of uh, how you're building it so that when you're laying them out on the ground it makes sense. Planning in things like hoisting apparatus so that we know the center of gravity for all these things, we know how they need to be lifted. So instead of having damage created by people putting slings on very heavy, you know, this is a 4,000 pound panel, um, you know, we build in the hoisting so that it's all taken care of and very quick. Another factor that happens is that a second set of shop drawings had to be produced by the fabricator of the, um, of the modules. And that's a shame, really. We'd like to have sort of a more streamlined approach to shop drawings. So ATCO, who, who built this with Bird Construction, uh, had to create their own coordination shop drawings, which uh, you know, go into a very detailed way of how all of the kit gets put into the wood box. And then they receive the shipment, lay everything out on the floor, and can put together a module using kind of conventional means uh, in an hour or two. Um, very simple technology to, to mate panels and to erect them. And that six-sided box would then be shipped. This is that automation we see around having uh, the, the drill holes already, or the holes for screws already um, drilled. And then just simple, um, this is actually log building um, a come along ratchet. The holes where the spikes from this, this ratchet clamp um, goes in were actually already pre-drilled too, so they knew how it had to be erected. It meant for very little work in the field. This is that service chase that happens on the back with the highly coordinated um, mechanical systems so that they could be coupled with no skill in the field. Basically, couplers would put together all of these pipes and ducts. And then the inside face um, was a Trespa panel fixed with structural Velcro. So. Um, the panels could all be serviced from the corridor without interrupting anybody inside the room with no fasteners. This is what it would look like. And this is the one we built. Um, so we really embrace the wood aesthetic. It's incredibly durable. Uh, there's also no nasty off-gassing with things like vinyl face gypsum or any of the problems with wet trades. There's no wet trades involved in this building at all. That's the table made of offcuts. So equally inspiring, we, uh, one of the other projects that we've really looked at wood and, and what the potential with wood fabrication can is, is if you're familiar and you're in Vancouver, living in Vancouver, this is the uh, pavilion at Great Northern Way. It's the one at the new um, campus for Emily Carr. Um, it would be, this would be the future house for Nemesis Coffee. And the idea there was to create a landmark uh, working with low tide and PCI, um, essentially creating this landmark for the new community that's 
essentially changing. Uh, Falls Creek Flats area used to be an industrial land that you know is transforming slowly into the city's innovation hub and, and for the creative. Um, so understanding how they can you know create a, an expressive structure that would house a very public program and become this attractor for the city community and become the heart uh, was the idea behind this pavilion. Um, but then you know for this particular talk, talking about like what are the things that we're going to look at uh, to actually advance the architecture um, of mass timber through the process. Um, so the idea here was how can we fabricate uh, the curved, double curved structures out of mass timber. And again, with our passion in creating uh, more wood products, uh, more buildings that rely on wood as its primary structure, it was a really good time for us to start thinking about, okay, and, you know, all of the mass timber products that we're using right now are flat packed. Um, you're, you're looking at very orthogonal uh, structures. Does mass timber or timber in general have a place in such an expressive form? Um, we need to really start thinking about other structural alternatives, but the challenge here was we want to build it out of wood. How can we do that? Um, and this kicks the research engines in, in our firm, and you know we start thinking about how do you actually create such an expressive structure um, within the context of the city, and actually with local fabricators um, start to collaborate on uh, a wood product. So to describe the structure here, it's, it's composed out of 10 petals. Um, the idea behind the design is that it, it mimics the, um, the, the flower petals. Um, uh, you know, mimicking the idea of being an attractor. So similar to how a flower would attract bees around, this is an attractor to the community in a way. Um, so understanding that you know, those 10 petals um, are going to be built out of wood, the five petals at the bottom uh, essentially connect together to a ring beam, and the top ones are the more expressive ones that rest on top of the five inner petals, uh, and the space in between is grass. So the idea came up as, okay, let's create prototypes. Let's start to understand how we can how might get at fabricating this. And we're working with designers, with our uh, structure engineers um, and fabricators to, to look at how we can do that. Also understanding what is the process that would be needed for it. So built-in rhino, grasshopper, we started looking at a way to slice um, the curvature. So understanding that you know a piece of, of the pavilion, one of the panels, um, would have this curvature and it's actually double curved. How would you start slicing it um, to create a prototype that would benefit from dimensional number, uh, but actually fabricate it in a way where it can be packed together um, so that it can create complex shapes? So this is how you know when you start contouring the very complex curvature um, and start laying it out one by one, you start seeing all these segments uh, of two by eights that we would then name laminate together and would become an LLT prototype. But it's an NLT that is taking the curvature. It's not a flat piece. Um, and then you know, thinking about a rig to actually put this together and go through a process where, through the design process, we start thinking about, OK, as designers, we're going to really understand how we can create that prototype. So that was before even starting to talk to fabricators. We were wanting to think about the proof of concept. Uh, so I went down to um, Autodesk Build Space, which is now they call the uh, Technology Center uh, down in Boston. And it's, it's an amazing facility that has all sorts of new robotics and um, advanced fabrication techniques. And we started thinking about this, this process. So here is the two buys essentially on a three axis CNC uh, that would cut them into the specific staggered angles that would then be assembled together. Um, going through a manual chopping piece, so that's you know, part of the process. Each of the little pieces is essentially indexed uh, with the exact angle and cut, and then it's numbered so that you know where to put them in. Um, and then we go through a process of essentially laying that triangular curved panel up one by one uh, through dowels and uh, essentially a nail gun uh, going through that and creating uh, a nail laminated timber uh, prototype. So that's you know just showing the process. Each of those pieces has is trapezoidal in, in shape and the exact angle is precisely cut so that together they amalgamate the, the actual curvature and once you start putting them on top of each other, the action create the curvature in the, in the um, third dimension. And then getting the prototypes to be put up in a mill uh, or on a jig for milling. 
and then looking at a 3D uh, five axis CNC milling machine to actually mill the underside of that surface into a smooth surface. So taking this as a structure um, and being able to see the wood. And you know, very similar to the prototype at Dilly Creek that Derek was talking about, we want to celebrate wood. So it's not just about building with the structure in mind, but it's also what we want to see from the inside is the process. We want to be have this project as a demonstration and education piece as well. Um, this remains to be a piece that is uh, held up in Boston. I think it was too heavy to bring back to Vancouver. We have a small piece in our office. You're welcome to see it at any time. Uh, but this is essentially showing the smooth milled surface on a five-axis CNC um, and how do you create a structure uh, panel out of it. Again, that was uh, the prototype that we went through the design process. And you know, as, as you go with you know, starting to talk to fabricators, more ideas uh, are being presented. Um, and this is where a shift of thinking from the 3D nail lamination towards a, a monocoque, um, or essentially a waffle type of structure that is still using the advanced fabrication technique, but it's, uh, it's more lightweight and it's using less material. Um, so the prototype in our side was, was very beneficial in actually coming to a place when you're talking to manufacturers um, with a lot of confidence that this is something that's possible to do. Uh, it, it's one, way, one thing to have a very um, sort of creative and expressive structure and essentially saying, okay, this is a sexy image, please do that for us. The other thing is actually having spent you know, a few weeks into trying to build a prototype and actually make it happen and having a structure analysis to, to verify that. So we proceed with you know, another alternative, essentially building that monocoque. And you know, it, it is composed out of a few uh, 3D CNC Gulan um, beams, uh, purlins in between, and structural sheathing. Um, and again, you know, looking at physical prototypes, very similar to what Derek has been speaking about, you need to see it. Um, and in here, this is laminated from the inside with um, very thin plywood, birch plywood. Um, so that you're still celebrating the fact that it's built out of wood, and you're creating that atmosphere inside that is very warm, very similar to the initial thoughts around creating the uh, the three NLT. These are photos from the fabrication soffit spearhead, um, an amazing facility. Um, essentially, you're seeing here how the glue lamp beams are and the furlins in between and all the blockings, and we've also through the process. Um, had to put in um, a few steel plates, uh, so that helps stabilize the, the ring beam and, and, the, uh, um, and the dome. And interestingly, talking about the process, this was a full design to fabrication process in a, in a direct way. Um, there were drawings that were not used for fabrication, they were used to obtain the city permits. Um, so that was actually the entire building permit set uh, for this project, and, and you could see there's like three or four details that are just showing intent in a way. But the process was completely digitally complicated. And I think that you know, speaks about a, a move forward. As these construction techniques change, we also need to start changing our processes within the city. How can we actually automate that review process where we might need those for our own coordination with the consultants, but do we really need them for the builder? for the permit and how can you actually share the smartness of the 3D model because there was an extremely detailed model that we were going back and forth between us and Spearhead, uh, which took all of the details of fabrication down to the bolts and where exactly the anchors are. Uh, but then that get all gets lost when you're you know, creating 2D sheets. Um, so how do you actually create that smartness and then take it forward? Um, these were the range of softwares that were used to build the pavilion. Uh, from our side, running on the Rhino Grasshopper, some Revit work for creating the permit, um, and then into Rhino essentially feeding into CAD work for the actual fabrication. Uh, Spearhead, this is a time lapse that uh, essentially shows that fabrication process at Spearhead's side. And here you see the essentially the different panels showing the steel plates, the um, Blue lamp beams, the purlins in between, and then you know starting to put in a you know a few pieces of sheathing on the top um, to actually create the full panel. This would be one piece of the petals, one of the five petals, and it will be sliced in three. We actually take it away, disassembled um, into three smaller panels that would fit on a shipping truck to be then taken to the site. Uh, this is the site at uh, MIT Car University on Great Northern Way, and it's just showing how you know, these pieces were all 
prefabricated, assembled on site, built into the uh, to the site, and uh, going through that through the winter was a little bit of fun. Um, but as you see it, like if you drive by now, it's it, it is there. It, um, it remains to be occupied, and you know that should happen in the next few months. So uh, stay tuned. Here are some photos of the built product, which I think is fascinating to see just the wood there and, and actually have it there. This was a, a moment in time that actually shows the structure in its strongest. Uh, and I think it was fascinating seeing the double curvature and all of these sheathing um, was really interesting. And then the final product, as you can see it in Vancouver, um, as you drive by or walk through a great order way. And that's from the inside. This is the current state right now, it's <coughs> empty. And this would be the future house for announcements topic, so uh, stay tuned for this. Right. So we're lucky that we, we get to push a agenda for timber architecture with some fantastic clients. And the next project is aspirational. It's in its early days, but we wanted to show you it. And the question that we really started with was, how do you really build for the future? Um, this graph, I think, is kind of telling, uh, you know, all of the work we've done around lead and sort of pushing a sustainable agenda for the last 20 years has really been on harm reduction. It's been about trying to limit the, the negative consequences of what we do. If we get to net zero kind of levels of performance, we're, we're sort of not really harming, but we're not really helping. Where I think we really all need to go is toward a more regenerative um, approach to buildings where they start to heal um, the environment and the consequences of building that has happened to this point. So firmly we do lots of buildings in here and, and that's great. Increasingly we're doing buildings in here but we want to be doing buildings over here. So the building I'm going to show you is, is still in this middle gray zone um, but it's a unique opportunity. So we all understand that it's imperative that buildings use less energy. And it's really regardless of source, particularly if it's a carbon source energy. But the fact is, is that you know, the world's a big place. We really need to think about just consuming less in general. So for us, this means you know, building buildings to the PASFO standard or better, um, because by that simple fact alone, you create a building that's very likely to have low energy for its life. Once we get operational emissions down, so things like heating and cooling and making hot water, um, we need to start looking at the embodied emissions. So the emissions related to the fabrication of the buildings themselves. So this is the wood agenda that we're talking about. So making buildings out of concrete or steel, make a big cloud of carbon and contribute to global warming um, and climate change. Wood buildings don't do that. In fact, wood buildings can do the opposite and help repair that. So. Um, a balanced approach deals with operating emissions and embodied emissions at the same time. Again, we tell this all the time because we love this message. Uh, timber is the only thing we have that's made by the sun. So we think that buildings that are passive house and timber are a perfect marriage and that they're the best we can do today. So this is not rocket science. It's not an Apollo mission. It's not going to Mars. This is all things that we have great science on, that we understand, we just need to choose to put them together. And so we have the opportunity to do that. Now I will say that timber buildings are different. It's not like you can keep two designs working in parallel and make a decision later, oh it's concrete or it's timber, no. You really need to be designing a timber building from the beginning um, because they differ uh, in the workflow, in the construction techniques that will happen, the detailing, they're not just sort of binary switches that you can turn on or off. And tall timber buildings are even more uh, particular. Um, the differences are less pronounced on low-rise buildings, but when you get into 30-story uh, plus um, timber buildings, um, the reality is, is that it's very much a different thing, um, and it needs um, a different approach to engineering and also a different approach to construction techniques in order to do it. So a big question we always get asked is, you know, why even bother building tall buildings with timber? And the environmental story that I've already mentioned is fairly clear. But in Canada, we should remind ourselves that we're 80% urban, despite our sort of vision of the vast hinterland of Canada. 80% of us live in cities, and 50% of us live in the six biggest cities in the country. And the world's almost half urban now, or very much, uh, very close to that. So. Cities are a fact of life, that's where people live. 
There's only so much space to do things effectively in cities, so you need to go up. So if you want to have a low carbon approach to buildings and you want to do them in cities, they should be made out of timber. That's why we think tall timber buildings actually make sense. So this is what we're proposing uh, right now for a site in Vancouver. It's been labeled uh, Canada's Earth Tower by the Globe and Mail and some other media that have covered the building, but the opportunity here is to make um, a tall timber building uh, to the PASFO standard uh, that has a broad approach to sustainability beyond those two things alone. So a very low uh, energy use target, um, you know, very challenging uh, engineering um, that we need to manage, um, and the promise of maybe doing something uh, distinctive. You see a feature of the building are these uh, three-story interconnected winter gardens um, that are intended to both perform a social function of creating sort of a way for people in high-rise buildings to have a community, um, something that's meaningful. So these are convertible spaces that open and close in fair or foul weather. Um, but it also acts as part of the mechanical strategy to provide a sort of an overcoat. It's a buffer space um, that uh, is related to uh, our ventilation and preheating of air for much of the season. The plan is actually quite simple. It's basically a central core plan that's been splayed apart to open up the winter garden to the south and to have a daylit um, elevator lobby. But you can see the wings of the building are very conventional, small span conditions um, with a hybrid construction. So in this case, we're doing concrete uh, elevator cores and stair shafts and then timber floors and columns and beams actually in this case. This is a cross section through showing uh, uh, a greenhouse at the top and then uh, a set of winter gardens facing south with the convertible doors. The basic diagram is that timber buildings are prefabricated buildings. No one comes to a site with a pile of logs and turns it in you know, with a hammer and nails and a chainsaw. These buildings are highly manufactured, highly prefabricated. Um, we have someone right there who knows a lot about how to do this. Robert, nice to see you. Um, it's not just the structure though that's prefabricated. We think the same approach needs to be applied to the enclosure. So uh, the notion of a prefabricated uh, enclosure so that you can be plug uh, tying up the building very quickly as it goes up so that the wood isn't exposed to weather is fundamental to making timber work in our climate zone. So again, the enclosure is really essential to be working. The structural question is one thing. Uh, but getting an enclosure strategy that works with the t uh, timber system is really important. So the notion of prefabrica prefabrication and modularity is, is super important. That means speed. Uh, and the greater the commonality of detail between window systems and wall systems, the better. So we've been working with RDH on some approaches to um, an enclosure system that has some similarities with the unitized curtain wall, where there's a common uh, mating uh, detail that panels can connect to each other. Panels would be hung off the structure as opposed to sitting on the edge of the structure. So a, a lightweight cladding system because it's wood-based. Um, but using some of the, the technology around existing curtain wall technology to, to have a very quick to erect system. Some examples of details we've been working on with them. Uh, the example of Brock Commons at UBC with Acton Austria Architects, uh, Fast and Up. Um, you know, really showed us that you know, it rewards you to be enclosing the building as you go. As soon as you're capable of putting walls up, put walls up. Now we have complications in Vancouver of a bylaw that demands balconies for uh, residential space. So trying to incorporate balconies in a passivos enclosure on a timber structure is actually a very unique challenge. So we've been working out uh, lots of uh, construction details to have thermally broken balconies that are still uh, significantly made of wood. Um, to interact with the, the, the cladding system so that everything can still be erected quickly. These balconies would be all made um, prefabricated and then just clipped on to the building. There's four points of contact here. Um, so they would come off the truck and go onto the building once the enclosure was put in place. We're building a mock-up of this system uh, this spring. This is what the building might look like if we get permission to move ahead with it. Um, an aesthetic of wood that's dominant, a uh, building that makes its own energy, that creates a different relationship with uh, the surroundings and this material. So another question that we have with the same client is actually this idea of how should we build. Um, 
we were asked to do a, a building that was off-grid. Um, so a building that makes its own water, treats its own waste, makes its own electricity. This is where we need to go instead of relying on big grid-based infrastructure that's inherently inefficient. Wouldn't it be great if we had a distributed system where buildings were more independent uh, and maybe had less um, sort of reliance on, um, on, on the grid? So this happens to be in a remote setting again, north of Whistler. Um, it's a house, um, but we think of it as a laboratory, really, more than a house. So the fact that it's off-grid uh, and in a remote setting makes us think about every single thing that goes into it and trying to optimize how it could be built. So again, the same themes that you saw um, with the Dilly Creek project, uh, which Robert's uh, colleague Eric Karsh worked on with us, the notion of a modular building that's prefabricated, that's made out of wood to the Pasifo standard, um, is a sort of super attractive set of ingredients, but this one gets to be off-grid. So it happens to be a remote setting. This makes us focus. It's not that development should happen in remote settings in the future. That's not the, the future. The future is really about the attitude toward independence and the choices around construction techniques. So this is what the, the building looked like this summer. These are the plans. So we have a um, mechanical space in the bottom, uh, the main living space over one floor with a second level for bedrooms. This is unconditioned space on the edge for a, a wood-fired sauna and a storage room. Very thick walls. Um, these are about 60 centimeters thick uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, this building is on target to, to reach the PHI low energy standard. It's falling a little bit short of Pasifo certification. It's mostly because this window that faces the view happens to not get sunlight in it ever, um, which makes it a big leak. Uh, from a heat perspective. That's what the section looks like and the elevations. Some details around the coordination um, that we started to start between um, the panel fabricator, which is BC Pasifos in, in Pemberton, uh, the timber supplier, which is structure craft builders here locally, um, and our engineering consultants who, who helped us um, with the math. You see here is a building integrated PV as the cladding for the building. Some details about ex you know, celebrating the expression of wood um, through simple details. Again, that message we keep droning on is that timber buildings are prefabricated buildings. It's a highly automated process. Uh, they happen in factories. This is a shop drawing that we would get from StructureCraft around the production of the blanks, the dowel laminated timber sort of source material that would then get shipped to BC Pacifos to be turned into insulated panels with windows and you know, membranes and all that stuff. But you know, they plan uh, you know, the weights of these panels, where they should be hoisted, how they should be handled, um, so that we have great quality when it gets handed off to the next step, which is, uh, this is the shop in, in Pemberton. Uh, you know, lots of tooling and sort of cribbing to handle materials effectively to allow people to work on them. You see some blank uh, DLT material stored here, uh, waiting to be fabricated and cut to size. And then 3D panels uh, already insulated and membraned, uh, waiting to be shipped. Lots of mineral wool insulation stored around the place. Again, a separate shop drawing process for the panel fabrications. Um, I think there, there will be more commonality between the shop drawing processes in the future, um, but these drawings are concerned with making sure that the enclosure works, making sure that it's buildable, uh, beyond just wood fabrication. The wood fabrication is the easy part in a way. The air tightness is a tough, tough part. Just for scale, um, you know, these are some of the glue lamp beams that were used, but you'll notice that they already have the finish applied to them. They already have their connections prepared so that the process on site isn't really construction so much it's assembly, right? These things get hoisted into place. The connections are all really quite simple. They're already figured out as they go. And then building goes up very quickly. So there's a on-site crane. These panels are truck sized. You know, three or four of them come at a time on the truck. They get lifted off the truck and they get placed simple membrane tie-ins uh, occur and the building goes up quite quickly. So one thing that we did with this building that makes it maybe distinct and, and, and important from a workflow point of view is trying to use computation and analysis to drive performance. So in Pasifos buildings there's um, 
you know, reporting requirements and thermal bridge modeling that you need to do. There's this software called PHPP, which is the sort of energy simulation software that proves performance for the building. So what we tried to do was find a way to take our normal Revit workflow in 3D and turn that into results that could be put into PHPP. So there's new tools that are being developed right now that you'll be able to just buy and do this. We had to develop something when we were starting this. So what we wanted to do is understand thermal bridges using therm, but we also wanted to understand construction assemblies. So through a workflow that's a little bit elaborate, uh, we found out how we could take our Revit model, uh, execute sort of 2D CAD geometry in AutoCAD by using Rhinoceros, mating to therm, outputting Excel data that then goes into PHPP, um, and we get high-res images out of it as well so that we can include that in our submission report. So we didn't want to have a parallel workflow where we had to draw every detail over again for the purposes of analysis. So one model, one set of analysis. Lots of spaghetti in, in, uh, in Grasshopper, um, in Rhino. So you know, just making all these translations work. Um, the software can do it. You just need to think about the workflow. And, uh, and we came up with one. Um, which was kind of exciting and it lets us make these sort of beautiful analytical drawings that describe performance, um, but also are an uh, important part of the sort of reporting and submission requirements for the building. So the next project is a, is a small one. It's also a pavilion. Um, and it was part of a research process um, not driven by a client, it's more of our own investigation on how we can, again, can advance not just the fabrication um, of mass timber, but also the assembly. Um, so this is the nail laminated timber prototype, um, which essentially took place in uh, Greenville in 2018. Uh, the main research question here was, how can we fabricate complex <coughs> mass timber assemblies? And the idea, you know, as Derek was speaking about, you know, building in cities, uh, building tall with wood, um, and understanding the um, the international code that is actually shifting more towards the two story high. You know, how do you start affecting that construction process? Um, and thinking through mass timber um, from a design perspective, and one that leads to fabrication. So, with this question in mind. This is essentially the prototype that we had as our booth that we built around 18 in Chicago. And what it's showing here is essentially a piece of a high-rise building. That's, that's again, speculation. It's um, understanding from a pure research perspective um, how can we get to build something like that. Um, so this essentially is a two, um, you know, it's a post and beam structure that holds um, sort of an undulating um, facade system um, or, you know, external structure system made out of wood. And the idea there is that we wanted to build this out of dimensional lumber. And we wanted to have precise fabrication and assembly uh, through robotics to be able to, to put this together um, as a method of fabrication on site that will be done in the future. Um, so understanding that this could be a piece of a building, you could have a robot and you can actually put this together um, on site. This would be the, uh, the multi-story logic of, of, of that prototype that I was showing, and you would see that one prototype is essentially taking a piece here, and it's actually looking from, from the back. Um, so this would be the undulating facade of, of the speculation um, or speculative building. So again, using computation, uh, trying to drive the analysis um, and performance. Um, this was the process where we went through, and you could see here the you know the post and beam, the undulating surface, and you know very similar to the prototype that we did for the Great Northern Way Pavilion. It's it's about creating that surface, contouring the surface, then creating scripts that actually allow that surface to become uh, made out of the two piece dimensional lumbers, you know, giving maximum dimensions and minimum dimensions and, and thicknesses and all of that, and essentially finding. Uh, the logic behind where the nails would be. Uh, so that's also driving the fabrication process where it takes that undulating surface and drives it all the way to become the actual fabrication model. And then, you know, going into details, you know, from surface to the actual um, two by fours, 
um, where you know the exact holes are and how and where do you drill and where do you nail. Softwares that were used here, again, we're going through a rhino grasshopper process. This is the main software of choice that we're, we're working with in terms of um, essentially driving computation and driving design process in a more custom way, um, as well as for the robot communication, because this whole prototype is essentially around building that in a robotic fashion. Uh, Machina plugin was, was used for that, and then the ABD Robot Studio, uh, which essentially is the interface for simulation for the ABD robots. And again, what we did, um, great partners at Autodesk, we went to the Autodesk building space in, uh, in Boston, and th this was the work cell that we had. Um, so what we did was essentially take one of the robots that they had, um, put in a, a gantry, and you know this is this is where the robot can move up and down, and have workstations that start from stacking the dimensional lumber to an area where you put the different tools <coughs> that the robot is going to be using to a, a working area to an assembly area, and essentially thinking through the process of how do you take this robotic fabrication from design to construction, and how do you actually create that assembly um, and, and create the, the tools around it. Um, these are the tools that we used for this project. So at any point of time, the robot would be switching between those four different tools, from a gripper to a saw to a mill to a nail gun, and essentially putting that uh, all together. Um, little time lapse here, essentially showing the, you know, in a similar fashion, taking the wood from one side into the working area, into the assembly area. And an image of you know, how these pieces are being put together. Um, so very precisely understanding where the location of each piece are, where it starts, um, gripping it and holding it in place, and then nailing it. Um, then the logistics of actually taking those smaller panels, uh, putting it on the truck, going from Boston to Chicago for the Greenville Pavilion, and then the site assembly was more of a manual process uh, at, at the pavilion. After the pavilion was done, we, we did a, a 3D scanning, um, and this structure is 4.5 meters in height. Um, I believe it was about 72 millimeters off um, in, in that scale, which was actually a pretty good decision on precision on the scale. Um, and this is the, the prototype that we've had. It, it, was, it was a piece that you know, drew a lot of attention um, because the process here is essentially showing how we could actually use robotics for assembly. And it's not just the design to fabrication process, but it is going all the way on site for fabrication and for, for the actual assembly. Um, so this summarizes the process in a way where we're looking at you know, the models, the simulation from the ABB uh, simulation tools, bringing in the, um, the lumber pieces on in, in the work cell that we had, and then the robot arm essentially being able to switch the tools. Now it's getting a gripper of one of those panels, putting it into a corner that's a zero, zero, taking it up back again so that it's calibrated, taking it into the, the work area, and then essentially taking in the different processes that would cut the specifics of each piece of the wood into the exact angles um, that's needed. And then later on, it would take that piece and put it in uh, to the other areas. Um, it's, again, picking the different pools. Now it's a drill. It's milling through. Putting the tool back, gripping it up, moving it into where it is, and then it will take the nail gun and actually put it in place. Um, all of this process is, is, again, pure work from the architecture resource group. Um, so that is something that we're looking at. And it's the, the need here is that knowing that these are going to be construction processes in the future, we as designers need to be able to understand what the process is, because it actually affects our design process. Um, so not in any way that we're trying to get into the construction process in specific, we're not venturing into this, but we want to be the best collaborator and partner with any fabrication um, companies. And this is, you know, again, the manual sort of assembly process after each of those pieces were put together, uh, just to put it on site.
This pavilion was um, done in 2018. The process took about a year for us to figure and go through the prototypes and, and build. So I guess now the question is, what is the road ahead? And, and this is where we think, you know, as I mentioned, how do you take the design process and think about the future ways of construction? Think about building the grid. Um, and how do you take all these together and, and think about how construction and design might be done in the future? Um, so we've already <coughs> talked about how building with wood um, is our chance of fighting climate change. You know, all the great things about wood, the sequestering of carbon, the, the low body current energy, the, the way to actually do better for the world is through creating buildings that have that are being made with you know materials that are the right choices. So taking this, understanding that, we also understand that robotics are increasing the speed and precision. Um, it also allows the freedom of formal expression, which we've been exploring into these three pavilions. Right? Like we're, it's not just limited to the flag fact, it's not limited to the NLTs, the, the, the CLT that are you know, very orthogonal. There are ways to actually take this process and have very complicated and sophisticated um, expressions done in architecture the process. And we feel that you know, exploring these processes now enable us to be the collaborators for the future fabrication or the future construction process. So how do you prepare this design process where we actually think about the future is, is the way to go. And from a larger perspective, um, the world is going through a densification. You know, rapid urbanization is going to be a need. There's going to be a, a need for future housing at crazy amount of scales and speed. Which really means that the argument for robotics is going to be an easier one to make. Uh, when you're needing to build a huge amount of housing in a small amount of time, then the precision and the speed comes in mind. Um, so that demand of housing will help actually take that robot automation in the future. Um, so in Perkins <coughs> and Will, this is an LA. Um, this is a project that we won recently, and it's. Um, it was an RFP by the city of LA essentially to create modular um, housing. Um, we are going through a process where we're thinking about essentially taking in 72 foot modules that would enclose a, a, a living unit, the corridor, and the next living unit essentially in one prefabricated piece and being able to put these, uh, fabricate those um, off site and assemble them on site in future, and that's becoming a prototype uh, for buildings that happen in Los Angeles. It's also a way for us to rethink what uh, prefabrication looks like and what that modular housing is looking like, and understanding that you know you can have the pieces or the core pieces of living units prefabricated, and those are the building components, but the wrapper and you know the building expression could be completely custom, and that could be enabled by the automation processes. So. This might not look like a modular housing, but it is actually modular housing. Um, and this is where we're seeing, you know, where the future is. Um, and we, as a firm, are, you know, we want to show that environmental and social responsibility in, in using wood as a construction process and, and a building material, but also thinking progressively about the architecture expression, thinking progressively around our design process, our craft, and how they actually tilt these all and create the values for how the robotic construction future is going to be. So what we did was that we invested in a robot arm, and we actually bought a tabletop robot arm um, to look at those processes and have that familiarity with the designers um, come close so that you're not you know, going somewhere, you're not going to a fabrication shop, we actually have a small robot arm that you know, would start getting our designers more familiar with these processes. It would start looking at what are the techniques uh, for fabrication, you know, building small scale prototypes, building models, uh, quarter scale prototypes, depending on what exactly is the question for each of the projects, we can use this robot arm to help us fabricate and help us understand a bit more about the construction process. An array of softwares, again, being used with Rhino and Grasshopper being the, the basis, uh, but essentially uh, different functions that 
are mainly geared to things that we already do. Um, so things like you know modeling, um, <coughs> some past generation. You know how how do you take you know building models with you know, with foam cutters. You know di different things that we are already doing in our studios. Uh, how do you try to do these in a in you know a more advanced way that can allow us to iterate more quickly and, and cheaper too. So this is MRAD, which is the uh, robot assistance for architecture design that we uh, were looking at here. Uh, and again, you know, it's it's a small scale robot arm, uh, but the idea is that if we have this in house, you're essentially creating a much closer connection between designers and, and, and robotics and fabrication. Um, we can test this with you know a few different things around modeling with you know foam or or you know just looking at massing models, but really the, the main promise to bring this to our reality in studios is, is understanding this future fabrication construction techniques that will happen in the future, and understanding how we as designers can start shifting our design process and design thinking so that we're, we're best enabled for that. So the robot arm is uh, put on a kind of parts table that can be disassembled and assembled in one hour, and that can essentially fly between studios. Um, so the idea is whenever there's a project that has a prototype that needs investigation, we we'll actually ship the robot to that studio. Very similar to the other prototypes, the robot arm is able to pick many different um, heads in a way. So it can work with um, a foam, you know, wire cutter, a hot knife. It can work with um, photogrammetry. Um, you can put in an end mill or a chainsaw, and you know, so forth. So like, it is a very um, wide open platform for innovation in a way. You can really think about any process that can be automated or used that um, and think about how it can affect your design process. And this is where I was talking about the assembly and disassembly of, of the robotic arm. So we have those pelican cases that have the base for the uh, for the arm and this is essentially showing you know the full assembly that takes about an hour um, you know if you get shipped through the airport you get it into a studio and it's up and running in one hour. The arm right now is in LA, but it's coming to Vancouver in the next couple of weeks. Um, and again, building some more prototypes, actually bringing things in house is more exciting for us than flying one or two people to Boston to or you know somewhere else to do it. Like we're actually being able to do that uh, within our space. The other thing is like is there's there's a lot of training that's happening as well. So the idea is right now there are two or three people around the firm that actually know the process in and out. Um, as this travels, like this setup travels from one studio to the other, there's training that's happening and more people are able to engage with it. And you know, perhaps in future we have to have multiples of those. So it's, it's the idea is knowledge is not just in, in one person's head, but it's, it's more of a, a collaborative um, that is slowly spreading. Thank you so much. Um, so we have time for some questions um, or discussion if you want, but um, that's what we're doing right now. <laughs>